Okay, you're very welcome back to the Locker Room Podcast from dailysportscience.com. This is number 74, and this is a topic that I've wanted to touch on for a while since a couple of our members have been asking about uh, setting up a session and warm-ups and the, the physical aspects of the session as well. So with this is pitched at the club coach, I guess, uh, not exactly professional football or SNC coach, but more just your your normal uh, run-of-the-mill te- technical coach in GA and, and of course in professional football. And Ross, so we'll probably we'll probably call it football because that's the world that we we work in. <laughs> I know in the last few weeks you've had a few really good episodes with Lee Hayes and Alan Byrne um, in the professional football and, and youth development arena which was which was great and really popular just remember for all uh, the people to head over to our website dailysportscience.com you'll find lots of information there about signing up for membership three six and 12 month periods and also we have the online certificate in sports performance coaching which is there as well really good course and also the training periodized training plan for club uh, GA teams as well. So if you're a member, you get it for 20 quid. Non members is 40 quid. Ross, we're calling this what makes a good warm up. We're not really focusing on the science of this, it's more about the general kind of practicalities of the warm up. Um, and you're very welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, kids. Uh, it's good not to, to host this time. So it's, it's, it's nice to be on the other end. <laughs> and you still have the Italian flag uh, up, up over your head after okay. after England beat Italy a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, that was a very um, nice win from a personal level. So it hasn't happened for a long time. <laughs> very good. Okay, uh, let's jump straight straight in. Then we're just going to briefly touch on what what is a warm up, what makes a go- good warm up, and then we're going to have a look at a few things like looking at the 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 child, youth, adult, or what's the difference really between a warm-up for children and a warm-up for adults. And then we'll have a look at professional soccer or professional football versus the GA world. And also a small bit on the differences in warm-up between training and match days. And then finally, just some of the little things about cool down and how a warm-up can give you some good opportunities. So first and foremost, I suppose most people know the concept of, of ramp, but do you want to just briefly touch on that? And, and it kind of gives a nice, simple kind of approach for coaches to, to conduct a warm up. Yeah, of course, Kiers. I think um, I think first of all, it's important to note that like the warm up is essentially like preparing your players for that training session or the game. So that, like you said, the difference between the adult and the child and their level, that's going to have a huge impact on, on how you conduct a warm-up, and we'll come on to that. But I think the ramp method is a real simple method that's kind of uh, caught definitely the S&C world by storm as like a, a, a standard practice now, but uh, within coaching as well. So the UK SCA came up with a, a simple acronym uh, of ramp, which stands for raise, activate, mobilize, and potentiate, and just essentially takes your warm-up through a lower intensity type um, activity through a series of dynamic stretching and, and various activation patterns, that movement patterns that you might put into the warm-up as well. And then finishes off with some high intensity stuff, which we would call potentiation, which would prepare them then for the first practice of the training session. But it's really important to note that like that first training practice can still be part of the warm-up. So like we talk about warm-up being just a pure physical thing, but you know, numerous times at where I work now and in the academy where I work and also with yourself at London, we did a technical based warm up as part of the activation. And as long as the basic lower intensity principles are there and you gradually increase intensity over time, as long as it fits the physiological acronym, it, you can do what you want in, in, in essence. Yeah. And I suppose in some ways you can kind of get around the, the, the ramp protocol by changing the P. So, so if you have raised the body temperature, for or activate the muscles, mobilize the joints, and then, as you say, correctly pointed out, P for potentiate. If you if you change potentiate to prepare for performance or prepare for the training session, like you you correctly say, in ways you can then shoehorn in any kind of technical practice or game or collaborative game or whatever it is into the end of the warm up. And I suppose we would have 
we would have done that a, a huge amount, wouldn't we? Where the, the first practice is still part of the warm up, but it's it's definitely with the ball. It's either kind of a core skill, dedicated looking at at skill acquisition and improvement, or it's a little kind of mini uh, scenario, which is usually unopposed, I, I, I presume. Yeah, I, th- I think it's quite important to start unopposed with the senior player because um, like whether it's a psychological thing or whether the intensity they're going to go into an opposed practice is going to be higher or unpredictable. I think that's the, the, the key thing. You want to make sure just the body is ready for that unpredictable nature of opposed, opposed practice. So whether you do a, a purely physical thing to activate the body and go through certain movement patterns or whether you do that within a technical practice that is quite controlled, or a pattern, a certain pattern that's short in nature where they're not going to get up to high speeds to start with, then that's that's no problem at all. But I think it took us quite a while to get to that stage with the senior team, like especially at London, because you know the, the older players they feel they need a warm up before they go into training. It's almost like a traditional thing, it's a culture thing. So like we taught them over time, well actually we can go into to some technical work and start getting some sharper work in within six, seven minutes, but it takes a bit of time psychologically to get there and, and safely do so. So, like we, we we're big advocates of that and getting as much you know out of your training as possible and no time wasted. But you have to respect where the players have come from, what's their status, what's their age, what's their training history, what's their injury history, and that might guide you a little bit on how you start the warm up. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's interesting as well. So, like for instance, the body will adapt to whatever stimuli you kind of give it won't it and and also psychologically and like you say that when we would have been in qpr academy like we would hardly ever do a kind of physical warm-up at the beginning of the training session we'd probably just go straight into total control of the ball technical practice core skills and we introduced that with the london senior football team and as you say it does take a little bit of time and especially with the older players, and especially if you're going to have a hard physical conditioning session, you you probably could do with a bit of a physical warm up just to kind of even mentally prepare those players. Um, it's interesting with another team that I'm I'm working with as well, where we've got into the habit of doing the pre act pre activation in the gym inside indoors, and then just going straight onto the pitch from there. And going straight into a technical practice. So, in other words, you're you're basically kind of you've taken out that physical warm up on pitch, and you've just transplanted it onto the to, to the indoor arena. Yeah, sure. I think the the biggest thing is that like senior players have to be treated differently. Like they're they're more powerful. They're developed more. Like the the way the game's going in all sports now, there's it's more explosive. It's quicker. There's obviously a, a higher prevalence of injuries on certain muscle groups, and the hamstrings is a big one that. That we've seen across the board so you have to respect that as well and say okay we have to prepare these players to bring and be explosive in a sport so yes we can go into technical work as you said there you're going to have to do some preparation work in the gym not only to develop physical qualities but make sure they're ready to go on pitch and, and perform so if you are doing an extensive session that's you know a large sided game or counter-attack type team work or even you want to work on some speed work then you have to prepare the body. You know, you have to go through your dynamic uh, stretches and, and warm up all the, the, the muscles and, and stuff as, and activate all the muscles that are going to be involved in that and also take them through a series of build-up runs that are going to prepare them for sprinting. So yeah. th- there is there is an art to it as well. But in, in certain sessions, yeah, you're right, where things are tighter spaces and more intensive, do your pre prep in the gym, do your prep, and then go out and do some technical work and gradually build that intensity into, into a post-type work. Yeah. Okay. Class. Be- before I ask you just about some of the specifics of of ramp, about like, okay, how would you how would you typically raise the uh, core temperature? How would you activate the muscles, mobilize the joints, potentiate, and everything like that? Uh, I'll give you a, a scientific model that was come up. So you, I know you like these kind of these models that I come to you with. So this is by Professor Till up in Leeds Beckett University. You might you might have heard him heard of him and he works with uh, Leeds Rhino. It's not too scientific, but he's added on to ramp to rampage across this <laughs> session. So <laughs> raise the body temperature or core temperature, activate the muscles, mobilize the joints, uh, tensiate, and then you move into an activity. I suppose this is a session design, so that can be skill practice or, or uh, 
uh, game scenario, or sorry, match scenario based training or something like that, then into games. So whether that's small sided games, medium sided, large sided, etc., and then you evaluate the session. Brilliant. You said you weren't going to get too scientific. Can you cut that in now? Really? <laughs> well, it's not too scientific, is it? No, it's, it's okay. Quite, okay. <laughs> it's quite simple. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so just I suppose for listeners, it's interesting to know how long is your typical warm up, um, physical warm up. So, let's say if, if you look at like the FIFA 11 and also the GA 15 it's basically a physical warm-up and it, it takes it through ramps. So forgetting about technical practice and everything like that, what like my warm-up would probably physical would probably be about seven to eight minutes in, in total, I reckon. Um, yeah. But yeah, ju- just a few details around the physical. Yeah, of course. Okay. So if we're looking at uh, an intensive type session, so a session that's more smaller sided in nature, um, and we're not looking to expose players to let's say higher speeds and, and put them into I say more vulnerable positions where they have to be like correctly ready for and prepared for, then it would be about six, seven minutes. Uh, and you'd look at like key themes within that around Axel D cell. So you'd build up the razor would be all your dynamic type movements. So your jogging, your backwards jog, your side shuffles, your karaoke, all these types of things, two, three minutes to make sure the heart rate's high. And you just challenge them and get the body, you know, used to working in different planes and and different movements, etc. And you can still coach in those movements. You know, you can still coach them, and but you're taking them through a lower uh, intensity activity. You would then like activate and mobilize, which on pitch I join them together. But we're, we're not talking too much about the pre act now because there's a lot of prep that's done before that. But on pitch, um, the activation is is the dynamic like hamstring swings, your your you know open the gate, um, all these sort of things. Your hinging, your dynamic hinging, maybe some hop and hold for activation. These sort of movements are done within, again, two or three minutes and always dynamic. We keep it really dynamic and, and keep them moving. But your squat patterns, your lunge patterns, your lateral lunge patterns can be done within this time as well. Um, and then your potentiating and, and the potentiation phase or the prepare, preparation for training phase is getting them bridging the gap between a lower intensity activity for what they're going into. So if they're going into a higher intensity technical practice where they're going to have to Fast, go a little bit quicker and speed up and accelerate whether they're going to have to decelerate whether they're going to have to change direction that's when you put those locomotor themes in there to bridge the gap so not only are you working on mechanical issues and change of direction and, and how to decel and how to excel you're also preparing them for the physical activities they're going to get in their technical practice and i guess over time then that's where you use that section to challenge those qualities a little bit more and that's where we shift things to the more cognitive like side and more decision making and more agility side of things, which I'll be really honest, I've um, I've struggled to implement with the senior team this year as much as I have previously in the academy, and it, and it's quite interesting that the senior players want structure, they want like simple things, they want to just feel prepared, whereas from a performance perspective, we want to challenge their cognitive side a little bit, and that's not just within the physical, that's within within the technical practice as well. So yeah. that's where you have to know your group and say, okay, we want to develop these, but compliance is, is a little bit lower than if we get them actually working well in a more structured program then they're ready for training so that's yeah. kind of how i would structure it if, if we're going on more of an extensive day so we want to hit higher max speeds and once a week we should be like at least getting them up to 85 90 percent of their max speed and, and challenging the longer type sprinting that they're going to do in the game then the warm-up might be 10 12 minutes you have full preparation same ramp process you might focus a little bit more on posterior chain then with the potentiation, you take longer to build up to that top speed. So you might do five, six runways to get them prepared before you then give them one exposure and then they're into training. But obviously the training design will, will get some high speed running within a sport specific fashion as well. Yeah, and, and the, the, the P, the potentiate or the prepare for performance, that's where like in, in GA, you introduce some hand passing drill or you know, truck and trailer or something like that, move it on to some kicking, the same in like kick passing practice, the same in, in professional football where, you know, you're looking at passing square or setting circle or whatever it is before moving on to a performance. So like you say, it's that bridging that gap between going from being static sitting inside to like going at 100% high intensity levels full opposed practice or, or game or whatever it is. Where, yeah. Where does, where does the locomotive skills fit into that then? Like not ignoring, let's say match day, but in your training session of, of around the structure of the practice. 
Yeah, well, it definitely comes within the, the preparation phase or the potentiation phase. That's like the ideal time to put it in. Um, but we've done in the past where we, we've had technical practice as the activator, uh, as, as the razor. We've then done some dynamic stretching within the technical practice within certain breaks. And then we branched off to do your locomotive development. So they're really warm and, and ready and they've got some technical and, and you know skill training in as well. And then we'll take them away and do whether we do some agility work, some, some like max velocity work or whatever, but it, it depends on the culture that you've bred and the type of training program that you've got within your club. You can run through a physical warm up with the prepare, preparing for that locomotive at the end of it before they go into technical practice. And I guess also it depends on whether you're going to do an unopposed practice or not. Sometimes you might go straight into a game. Now, if that's the case, then you need to make sure they are physically ready to do that game. So you probably need a bit more of a, a structured physical warm up before that. Um, yeah, so, yeah. I, I, I do like it as regards the, the section, session planning. I have always liked where you do a warm up, whether that's like purely physical or a kind of blended version of physical and technical. Then you move into more technical practice. So with the ball, uh, um, passing, pass and move, you know, unopposed practice or whatever. And then we've often come back into the locomotive stuff then as well. And it just means that the body is really warm. You know, you're cognitively kind of stimulated and you're ready then for a higher kind of level and a higher cognitive load locomotive practice. You know, you don't need to do a kind of rewarm. The players are, are kind of primed, I suppose, for that. And I feel that you only need, you know, five minutes at that. Remember, we often did like the mirror drill or, or some kind of uh, reactive agility practice. And it's a nice kind of bridge as well for the coaches where you go warm up technical practice locomotive skills and then on to some kind of opposed practice or games after that yeah and and i think it also shows the value in the physical side within the, the training mm-hmm. program so like it you're if we take the mirror draw for example we're working on like real agility in different planes and 1v1 domination both in and out of possession even though you haven't got a ball but one's going to tap one's going to lead so like that is a huge important isolated part of the performance you're just stripping it back to pure ascent so then like you're going from low intensity technical work which scaffolds maybe some movement that you're going to do later in this session or but in a physical sense gets the, the body prepared technically but also like physically from, from a low intensity perspective then you're challenging yourself in a high intensity situation one v one you know you the body needs to be ready for that so that's why you do the, the free stuff but then you might go into some one v one attacking in the session so you're scaffolding that element into a 1v1 straight for goal you know what you take on your man yeah. be positive so all, the, so all all the things get linked together so having the coach in the sports science the physical staff all singing off the same hymn sheet around the coaching points of physical but also how it's going to lead into the, the technical tactical side of things as well and then goes throughout the session so i think it just brings everything together and just shows that this is our program it's not an isolated physical thing and it's not an isolated technical tactical thing because that that's not how sport is yeah, no, I agree with that. Uh, it actually, brings me on to another another point about the sequencing of practicing of practices within the session because it's become very popular now. I suppose more in the child and youth rather than the adult, but also in adult as well, where it's become a kind of a, a a cool trend to go. Okay, we do warm up, then we go into a game, then so we go whole part whole. So we go warm up game some sort of scenario based training and then back into the game. And I don't like it (laughs) whenever I did it myself as a player and also as a coach, I didn't like it. And for a number of reasons, like, first of all, which you touched on at the very beginning, just in terms of like being physically ready for the session. I I think it's nice to kind of have a little bit of a, a step by step process where you're building yourself up physically and cognitively as well to kind of participate in the game and the other thing I found so that was as a player as a coach what I didn't like was that what it's like once you give them the game once you take the game away from them they kind of switch off a bit Mm -hmm. and in ways it's like throughout the session the game is probably ultimately what the players all love to do you know within the session and the, the first few parts of the session is like okay, me as the coach or the manager or the person who's guiding the whole program and the operation, we need to work on X, Y, and Z, you know, our 1v1 tackling, our 
are you know set up uh, to uh, defend against their counter attack or whatever it is. So you're like building throughout the session, building throughout the session, and then you're into the game. It's like okay, show us what you can do, show us how you've learned. And I feel that if you just go straight away, okay, we're going into this game, you lose a lot of that. And it and when you come back out of it, it's like they kind of mentally switch off a little bit. Um, but I know it's quite a, it's kind of like a popular uh, thing. And actually, I suppose, as I mentioned about building up towards the game or through the session, that's as well your point about the scaffolding, isn't it? That you you introduce something in a warm up and you you take it on from there. Okay, I knew we'd digress. Here's, here's my here's my uh, <laughs> here's my thoughts on all of those. With uh, players that are pre growth spurt, so we'll talk about the child in a minute. With players that are pre growth spurt, so we call it the foundation phase, and I think it's something similar in in the GA, the foundation yeah. or the nursery. Like nursery I don't I, I don't think it matters from a physical yeah. perspective. They can go straight into a game and play, and and as long as you're as long as you're hitting all of your like learning points across a, a phase and a season, and you're giving them an all round holistic uh, program from a physical perspective, technical, tactical, psych, social, like it doesn't matter too much. I do agree with you though, that once players go into a game to then come back and teach them some sort of movement and some sort of skill, I think it's hard to get their focus back onto that movement of skill because their head's still in the game, even at a young age. So one thing that I, when I spoke to Alan Byrne about that they do really well over in um, Lourdes, is it Celtic Lords? Lourdes or, Celtic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, not bad memory. Um, <laughs> they, they, have the, they have little stations so they have like four or five groups where mm. they have little activities going on that yeah. might be a 2v2, it might be a passing practice, um, it could be, um, I don't know, in Gaelic, a captain high ball practice, but a game. But they've got all these different skills that are going on and then they bring it together for a game after. So I really like that. Lots of variation, lots of coaching points, lots of interactions, and then they go into their game. But I think once they go post-growth spurt, you have to gradually prepare them from a physical perspective as well because you want the game to be the best quality game it should bring everything together so mm. from a not from a physical perspective but from a teaching perspective like what do you want out of your outcome for this game well i'm going to design this game to work on counter-attacking okay so what do you want physically for counter-attacking well, i want them to be able to run fast over 30 40 meters and and seize opportunity when it's 3v2 i also want them to be able to recognize when to play the ball forward i also want them to recognize when there's time and space to run with the ball so they're the practices that you put into place for your first part of the, of the second that makes that game even better. So physically they're prepared, but also they're mentally switched on and they know the coaching point. And then that's what transfers into the game, hopefully at the weekend. So I think post growth spurt, I, I think sequencing, yes, you can put a game in there to, to like an arrival activity to wake them up, but I don't think you're getting much out of that. I think you're just getting a little bit of fun and a little bit of enjoyment from a coaching and preparing them for the real game at the end. I totally agree. You have to really methodically think about physically, what do they need? Tactically, what do they need? Technically, what do they need to link into that game? And I think once the players get into growth spurt sort of ages for boys, but 12, 13, 14 and girls, 11, 12, like you have to be really careful in the body and make sure they're prepared for that as well. Yeah, yeah, true, true. OK, and just in terms of the scaffolding, Ross, I know you've mentioned it uh, in, you know, in a blog before and everything like that, but can you just run through a really quick example you know if you're like yeah you, you go ahead with it all right let me try and tie all of this together from a physical perspective and technical tactical so if we wanted to do a session on combination play in the final third so an intensive session around your forward players combining in and around the box to, to, to score right so physically what do we need well it's going to be an intensive session so we're going to scaffold axel details change direction so the warm-up's probably going to have an element of that in it, as well as general prep. You're then going to focus all of your technical practices on tighter type passing, recognizing when we have to pass quickly in threes and fours to, to combine around the goal. So mm -hmm. even though it's a passing practice and you're working on the detail and the weight of the pass and what type of pass, and it might be different variations of passes, outside foot to break a line. It might be playing into the front man and a set up back and through. Any of these type of practices, you're always linking it to the end game. So it's like, okay, well, we want quick combinations. Why do we want to play off one and two types? Because we're in and around the area. We haven't got much time and space. There's lots of defenders around. We've got to move them quickly. So your technical practice is designed around that. Then you will take that into like an opposed practice where it might be a, a 4v3 to break a line, for example, or it might be a, a 5v5, but you've got to try and break a line, trying to get past that last line of defense just as a breakout type position. 
but everything's tight again. Everything's got to be done on one or two touch, ideally, to be able to move the defence and, and, and create some gaps. And then you'd probably end the session on a, a phase of play type practice where you're in the final third and you set up a back four or maybe two sitting midfielders um, and you're playing against maybe a front three and maybe a midfield three, so 66. And you're looking at trying to break them down. So all those sort of things you've worked on on the prior, the physical, technical, tactical, around quick combinations of movement. Now you're introducing some width and height to try and stretch the defence. But you're looking at your different passes, trying to slip players through. So I really like the scaffolding aspect of going from a, a lower intensity and technical type practice, not because we're working on isolated techniques, because we're setting the scene for what's coming in the game. And I think that's what gives you most, most um, productivity and most like clear rationale in your game, as opposed to just saying, we're going into a game, this is what I want you to work on. They haven't had the pictures in their mind prior to that practice. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, no, that's an ex- excellent explanation. And I think it shows the proper integration between your SNC coach, sports scientists, uh, technical coaches, managers, you know, it's it's something that certainly isn't isn't taught at universities, I, I would think. And then the other thing is that when people think about their uh, multidisciplinary team, so their MDT, they think about the physio, the sports scientist, the SNC coach, the manager, the coaches sitting around together before the session and planning are, are speaking through the players. But sometimes this aspects of that integration gets lost a little bit and in ways it's the most important where you're actually you're planning out the session together rather than the coach saying this is a session that i'm i want to do you know and 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 that's it i i I think it's it's much better much more efficient if you kind of develop a session together in in that way yeah and look it's not easy and it's not being done at top level at times you know i think it takes um it takes really highly skilled like coaches, sports scientists, practitioners to know the other aspects of, of the performance, not just their own areas. Um, and it takes a, a, a someone to sit back and look at the bigger picture. So like on a week basis, this is physically how we'd want to prepare from a one game a week. But then obviously then week to week, what do we specifically want to work on? Can we fit that within the physical framework? Does that link in with the periodization? And they're the sort of conversations you have. Um, so yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy and it's not done often, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, just just moving on slightly then. So when I was thinking about the child, the youth, the adult and the different types of warm-ups, it, it made me think that in ways warm-ups are an opportunity there for the practitioner and whether that's your SNC coach or your, your technical coach. And I, I jotted a few things down that obviously there's the physical, physical aspect and the long-term athletic development. So at times it can be an opportunity to go, okay, well, I've got, you know, in some clubs, like I remember when, when, when we started a good while ago, we had half an hour at the beginning of a session for physical development. Now way, way too long, but on the other hand, okay, you take it as a kind of a, an on-field locomotive, um, physical development, s and kind of little unit that you can develop the players in. Um, also, of course, like with the really young, the child and, and the, the, the really young pre-academy or even, as you say, pre-growth um, spurt, you've got, you've got an opportunity to bring some fun into the sessions as well and enjoyment and everything. Also, I like some of the things about like the collaborative games and the problem-solving games. And like when I look at little clips, video clips on Twitter now, you can see some clubs, even adults now, are starting to introduce little things like that. And it is about fun and enjoyment, but and, and also just kind of lighten the mental load. But also there is kind of teamwork involved there as well, isn't there? And and collaboration. But and maybe we'll touch on it in a second. You you need the right environment. You know, when the team is winning, everything is going well, it's kind of easy to do stuff like that. Or when you're way on on training camps and everything like that. And also the final one is just about, it's an opportunity to practice your skills, you know? So if you can go straight into your core skills, your total control, your um, unopposed skills practice, you're, you're using that chunk of time. And I know like from the club that we've been working in, in the academy, you, you don't get to use that for 15 minutes for physical 
preparation for the session. It's more about, well, actually, we want to use that 15 minutes to work on our skills. And if you think of if we're going to train, let's say, you know, three times a week, four times a week, and that's four by 15 minutes across the week in a very limited time that you actually have access to these players, all of a sudden that's an hour of a week that you're, you can devote to kind of physical preparing, physically preparing for the session versus your, your technical uh, development. Yeah, totally agree. I think it's about looking at what the players need, like ultimately. So like you said there about the games and like the fun stuff, okay, when are we going to drop this in? Are we in a really good place and want to keep that going? Are we in quite a bad places? And this is more at the, the first informant side. Um, are you in a bit of a bad place where you want to try and shift the mentality and lighten the load, like you said? Um, what do we need more of as a group? Do we need more technical work? So therefore, we understand that the physical side is really important and that physical kind of time and opportunity to work on pitch, we might take down to two times a week and then supplement two times for extra technical type work or or ILP type work or individual practice. So I think it's about coming up with a, a, a collaborative decision on what, what we think is important for that group. Um, when we was at London, we valued both. We had to get the players physically better, but we had to get the players technically better. And that probably drove a lot of our practice towards shifting for some of those core skills and, and having some of that stuff. But at some clubs, maybe you don't need to get the players technically better and you need to work on physical skills. So yeah. I think it's just having an appreciation of, of everything and what, What's the best for the players? What do the players need the most? Yeah, it, no, it's a really good point because if you think of your under 18 um, football squad, like they've gone from being part-time under 16, then at the age of 16, 17, coming into a full-time environment for the first time. It, and you can see those players physically developing so quick. You know, they're adding on muscle mass and and you need to move and work on their movement and, and everything. But it's a great opportunity at that age to probably you know, just to bed down a few good techniques, like even, you know, sometimes the players can't hinge properly or their squatting technique or lunging technique, stuff like that is is still basic. You know, even at that age, you expect them to be better, but it's probably a good opportunity. I wanted to ask about at adult level and whether that's first team professional football or, or GA. And you said about sometimes they don't enjoy the kind of, cognitive load and and the the problems the physical problem solving or or whatever it is and i do wonder and like i probably i was probably it, it affected me at times when i was playing as well where you just kind of just want to get through the warm up you know where you want you're out on the pitch and it's like i never enjoyed warm ups myself i have to say um and it was just a process of okay get me through this 5 10 minutes and let's get on to the ball work and the important stuff. And, and it might be just like where you're saying that you want players reactive agility and, you know, the cognitive load and thinking about things. Some players, and sometimes they actually want the exact opposite, where it's like, give me something where I don't have to think, where it's like out to the cone and back, high knees, flick your heels, dynamic stretching, et cetera. And then, right, let's go move on to the ball then. And maybe in professional football, it's even more pronounced because you're training practically every day and you're doing so many warm-ups across your career that you just, you just get a little bit bored. Yeah, 100%. Um, I found it challenging because there's certain things that you want to like progress on from a locomotive perspective. Like we, we had a really good model like in the academy where we would take something from closed skill make it slightly more open and then really shift that into like 1v1 chaos and still telling the same physical skill, whether it be max speed, whether it be agility and, and we and we precursor movements there. I found it really challenging to implement that model here, partly because of those reasons you said. And if in an agility practice, in a mirror drill, someone's not willing to go 100% and react with their partner or challenge their partner, then you're not going to get benefit from it. So you kind of think, okay, well, they're going to get those agility and sport specific movements in the in training. They are going to get that within 1v1 practice, within the game itself. That's the game. That's the 360 nature of it. So I'm going to have to strip that side back a little bit and get the physiological aspect really done and honed down well. So that when have they sprinted once a week? Have they done certain um, every cutting angle? Have they, you know, gone through different movements, side shuffle, drop turn, cross set, whatever it is? Have you really nailed down that side? Um, and 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 the conscious side gets taken care of itself into the uh, in in the technical practice. Now, I 
hypothesize, I don't know, but the lower down the level you go, and especially when we've done it at the Gaelic, we had really good compliance. So mm. we was able to challenge them physically and cognitively and decision making wise. But I think the higher up you go, and I'm just speculating out the Premier League, I think it would be even harder to implement models like that. So you have to read the group, you have to see what you're going to get the best out of. You have to still try and get some respect from yourself. And if you're putting on lots of practices that aren't getting compliance and aren't thought are very good, then you have to have, just assess it and just say, okay, how can we still get these these out of it in a different way? Yeah, that, no, I think that's a really good approach of, of like what do the players actually need rather than here's my kind of concrete model that I that I follow. Um it, it, that that's an interesting point actually about the probably the difference between professional football and for instance the GA world or or grassroots or something like that, where those players actually can see real benefit in a mirror drill or a reactive agility or or something like that, where they can feel themselves improving and physically developing in those situations. And I think it's a perfect opportunity then to actually practice those things where they get actual real benefit from it. Just linked on to that then as well. I think in terms of the child or, you know, the young youth, so let's say from, you know, the age of four or five up to maybe the age of 15, 14, 15, like the skill practice has to kind of come number one at that point. And, and we, we always say in the academy that a player will fail, you know, to, to let's say get to the next level through their, their technical proficiency rather than, you know, whatever it is, their speed or their tactical now. So whatever it is, I suppose decision-making comes into it massively as well, but that's where it probably shifts at that younger age to, okay, having it fun and enjoyable, but also you spend more time at your skill practice rather than, you know, physically preparing for the session. Yeah, okay, here's my views again on that. So I think the younger it is, that's definitely the case because it is, it's going to be a skill-based assessment. But when you get to 15, 16, your assessments are more like holistic. So can, can this midfielder get around the arena? Um, if they can't, why is that? Is it a growth uh, issue? Have we lost opportunities to make them physically better earlier on in the years, which allow them to get around the arena? So I think as a, as a young child, it's about putting on sessions that develop all these qualities. So we isolate the skill development, but within the week, we also make sure we give them bigger space opportunities to be able to practice running in larger areas. So we're still yeah. playing the game. We do tighter type stuff to ensure that they can change direction and are also very technically good in tight areas. So it's just about having that holistic view and making sure you've got an eye on the physical side because there's no doubt about it now. The game is physical. And if you can't move, like you are going to be predetermined at the level. There's a lot of players playing in League One championships who aren't technically brilliant, but they're athletic and they can jump and they can kick it, they can head it, they can run into the channel. So we have to think about what we're preparing players for. Are we preparing players for the Premier League and at international level? Probably not. Most of our players are never going to get there. So we have to think about where we're preparing them for. But yeah, I think as you go through the pyramid, 15, 16, we have to have an awareness of the system side. And are we giving that player enough physical development alongside everything else to make sure they're successful? Yeah, yeah, great stuff. Okay, last two questions. Um, just briefly, match day versus training day warm-up. Do you have any thoughts about the difference, different approaches, let's say, to both? Yeah, well, I think like a, a training day is an opportunity to develop something. So a training day is specifically linked to what we're doing in training or to a certain skill that you're trying to develop. But a match day is about preparing them to perform and go to war. So I like match days to be structured, um, to be the same. Players need to know what they're going into. Match day, whether it's a physical warm up, into the technical practice, into the possession, into the unit work, like everything stays the same. Um, and players know that, so they haven't got to worry about what's coming in the warm-up. They can mentally prepare themselves. And there is an element of seriousness, like real focus, real determination. And in 30 minutes, guys, you're going to win this game. You're going to, you're going to war. You're going to put your bodies on the line. So physically, they need to be prepared for that. We need to make sure that they've, they're fully warm. They've gone through that ramp stage. They've ran at a good speed to be able to go and prepare in the game. Um, and also, they've, they've done some sharp technical work. They've been put for a possession where they've got some opposed nature in there and physically they've worked to a good level. Um, you know, a lot of research, uh, research says that if you take a certain play, um, a certain athlete's level in terms of lactate to a, to a higher level, 
and then give them adequate rest and they're going to perform well and we talk about the concept of second wind and things like that but you have to make sure that players go at a good intensity you give them a rest in between they go back and change them they get themselves ready but they have to work in the warm-up they have they can't just post for the warm-up they won't be mentally ready they won't be physically ready so yeah. it has to be more structured and you have to physically prepare them for what they're going to do yeah and even if that they're in like very short bouts just to hit that kind of 100 percent maximal intensity so they're just prepared for obviously you know when the whistle goes and they may have to do a 50 meter sprint for instance you know straight off the bat and and tackle turn etc use of the ball physical contact they need to be prepared for that uh, last question then which is the aspect of the training that you love the most obviously uh, <laughs> the cool down <laughs> so would you would you do a cool down with um well with any across the age groups or across the sports or what are your thoughts on it uh, for me we don't do them we don't do them at all um i think there's like a definitely like a research in there i think from a psychological perspective sometimes you get the team together and they and they they have a cool down but in the environment that we're in, as soon as training finished, players go straight inside. They go and, you know, it's about recovery now. If they're not going in the gym and doing any work, how can we recover? Food, um, let's go get some food on, let's go get rehydrated. Maybe ice bath if we're in, you know, multiple game week. Um, all these different, maybe get your compression garments on straight away. Or maybe go and see the physios, the game ready and ice and whatever from an individual perspective. So it's about as soon as that training and match finishes, how can we now recover for the next activity? So I think yeah. you're better off doing those sort of stuff as opposed to an active recovery that may add a little bit more load to the body um but with little with i guess less benefit from a recovery perspective because the body's going to flush naturally out anyway within 60 to 90 minutes so how can we how can we get good food in rehydrate do all those other recovery modalities that i think probably adds a little bit more weight than a than a cool down yeah and even i mean it can actually have an adverse effect if you're stretching the muscle it might add additional you know micro tears of the muscle fibers when you've already you know put them through a high load and and as you say getting players to to jog and do more running you're just adding additional load but but i do yeah i i, I like the psychological kind of unwinding of that but like why can't that be done for instance just in a in a little huddle and a chat and stuff like that or get back into the dressing room together you know okay great any any last final thoughts you wanted to add in was there anything you you wanted to touch just, on just quickly uh touch upon the pre which i think would be quite important mm. to just mention especially for those that well i've got facilities at club level um probably more senior level i would say this would apply for like don't neglect the pre time so the, the pre stuff we do inside so general foam rolling mobility work um movement prep with hurdles your squat patterns your lunge patterns all these sort of things but also specific development over time so whether you want to look at plyometric development when they're fresh depending on the theme of the session so if you're going to go into like intensive type practice then we want to look at a lot of multi-directional plyometrics and maybe some like hop and hold so we get some eccentric control if you want to go into some more extensive like higher speed run in there you're looking at your drop jumps your hurdle bounds their contact times really quick so without getting too scientific and if you've got an expert in your building to be able to develop deliver this don't neglect that pre act time as an important part of the warm up because it saves time on the pitch and it also develops players' physical like capabilities over time that are linked to the pitch stuff. So, yeah, you might do some like hip extension stuff, some wall type drills, some, you know, your power type work that you'd like to do when they're slightly fresh and it's non fatiguing so that when they go on to they're not only primed on the pitch, but they're, they're enhancing their performance and ready for what's coming. Um, so just I think if you've got space and facilities and the experts to, to deliver that, definitely mm-hmm. utilize that program and, and lean on them to come up with a program that they think is appropriate. And it's all part of the gym program. Some some prior training and then the heavier stuff and strength stuff done after training. So um yeah, just something to think about. Yeah, yeah. And actually it's a really good way f- to prepare the players for the session mentally as well, isn't it? Because they're inside then they're already kind of getting together, going through the work doing really important work and it just means that on the pitch as you say you can spend less time on your kind of your physical warm-up then on the pitch okay yeah. great ross always enjoy our chat we can um we can probably end up chatting about any topic and uh enjoy it and hopefully give across a little bit of information for the listeners um thanks for joining us again remember people head over to dailysportscience.com 
see all our special offers there for membership of the elite coaching group and also remember to um to register for our podcast as well subscribe for our podcast get it every two weeks fortnightly and uh, hope to see you again soon thanks everyone thanks for us cheers cheers